All right, so I want to give everybody an invitation to just unmute yourself and say question. Just like, let me know when there's a question. Uh, if I'm going through it, I've added a lot of examples to the cohort one slides and some of them were maybe not so intuitive. <laughs> So if you have a question, just interrupt me because I'd rather get to it before we move past it. So feel free to do that. Um, and we'll try to finish on time. I don't have exercises in here, um, but I did add a number of examples. Um, and the uh, slides kind of assume you read the chapter. So I hope everybody read the chapter. It, it kind of summarizes the basics rather than going through them in detail. So. Here we go, uh, chapter seven in advanced R all on environments. I'm Steven Holsenbeck, um, data analyst living in Milledgeville, Georgia right now. And R is awesome. If you haven't had the chance to go to the R conference, I highly recommend it. Uh, so just a quick recall from chapter six on functions. Remember that name masking occurs in the execution environment inside of a function. So names defined inside of the function are going to take precedent on names uh, from parent environments. Um, and if it cannot be found inside that function, it looks up to the parents up to the global environment. Uh, functions versus variables. If you use a name, then the objects that are not functions are going to get ignored. Uh, each function environment is a fresh start, newly created, so it doesn't retain anything from the previous execution. And dynamic lookup are looks for values only when they're needed, lazy evaluation. So it has to be called explicitly for something to execute. Uh, the key takeaways for environments are that environments bind a set of names to a set of value. Every name in an environment must be unique. They're not ordered. So we'll see later that numerical indexing does not work. Every environment has a parent except for the empty environment. Um, environments are not copied when modified. They use reference semantics and a hash map. So the basics of environments is creating one. So there's an rlang env, which allows you to bind variables to names in the function call, as you can see here. And there is in base new environment, and you bind uh, variables to names with the typical assignment operator. And viewing the parts of an environment, environment print in Rlang allows you to see the environment address, the parent and the bindings inside of it, as well as their class. And environment names or base names are equivalent and give you just the names as a character vector. Important environments. The current environment, which is where the code will execute. Um, so you can see here, if we bind a new variable X, it then is visible inside the current environment. And the base equivalent of that is environment. There's the global environment, which can be accessed via this little namespace thing, dot global environment. I think that works in just normal R. I know it works inside of R Studio. Um, outside of uh, our studio, if you're like doing, wanting to call the global environment in a script, it's probably best to use either base global environment or Arlang global environment. The empty environment uh, is empty. It never has anything in it and it doesn't have any parents. It's the last environment on the call stack. The function environment, so, or also, uh, this is where the function is executing. 
it's not to be confused with the execution environment. Um, so if we put x equals one here and we can run this um, function here and see that the environment inside of the function is different from the environment that is called with caller environment from the function arguments. And then the package environment, we can see all the package environments that are loaded, um, including the global environment with using search. And you can look at what is inside of each of these package environments by, with ls using the position argument. So if we do position two, which is rlang, um, we can look at the first 10 variables in that environment. And they are the first 10 exported uh, functions from Arlang, most of which are these, um, I can't remember what the class of functions these are called, but uh, these symbolic functions. Yeah, infixes. Infixes, thank you, yes. Um, important environments continued. So this is kind of a complicated challenge question to think about as we move through the slides. Why does the caller environment return two different environments? And where is the internal argument environment coming from? So when we look at this, we have a caller environment that's called from the arguments to per walk. And then we have a, the um, argument version of caller environment. So called from a default value in the function. And then we have caller environment called within the actual function. And so when we look at these, the internal call to caller environment is the same as the call to caller environment in the function defaults. And then the external environment is a different environment. And when we look at the variables in these environments, we see that I, I is the variable that's in the internal one and the one that's provided as an argument. And then we see that in the external, there is enclose, environ, and an expression. Um, so does anybody have any ideas just right now as to why this I shows up, why this environment is different, or why this shows up in the external? No guesses? Okay, we'll, we'll move past it and it, uh, there'll be more on why that is later. So parents, every environment has a parent. Here's a little structural diagram. So if we have a environment with A, B, and C here, the environment here has D and E and it's its parent. And then the empty environment is the end environment. So a parent environment can be specified. Um, the calling environment will be used otherwise. You can call a parent environment with in parent or a parent in from base. So if we create an uh, environment, we can pass an environment to it with this Arlang env function, and that makes the parent of f e. So we can see that the parent and E are identical here. If we look at what's in F, there's nothing inside of it yet. We can also create a new environment with Arlang new environment. And we can add this variable in the first argument position, y equals x. And we can make the parent as E. So we can see that again, the parent and E are identical and we can see that y is now an variable inside of that environment and it borrowed x which was declared back here as one right there so moving on uh, with base we can look at the parent environment of a newly created environment and it is the global 
or we can set it with the assignment operator and then we can see that it is environment E. So R searches the parent environment and all ancestors sequentially up until the empty environment. The sequence of environments ends with empty, always um, retrieving ancestors using the end parents. And the default ends with global. So we can see if we use the end parents on F, we can see E here, and then it ends with global by default. Empty environment as we know has no names binding has no parents always the last environment so if we set empty environment as the last environment for m parents we can see that it goes up from f to e to global and then all the way up through all the package environments the auto loads the base and then ends with empty so super assignment this nifty operator here overwrites existing variables uh, with the same name in a parent environment, or it assigns a new variable in the global environment. And so we touched on this last week as to why it's sometimes discouraged. Um, so if we have a function here and we assign Z with the super assignment and we call F and we create this environment E um, and we print E, it is the global environment. If we use ls we can see that z got assigned into the global environment from inside this function because it wasn't assigned anywhere else so the reason that it's generally advised against is um, when a function is nested you could be reassigning a variable somewhere up the call stack or you could be randomly overriding a person's um, variables in their global environment if you're using this in a capacity that's going to be reproduced on somebody else's computer so that's why it's generally advised against using super assignment unless you explicitly uh, assign a variable inside of your function that you're going to overwrite. So this is one of the use cases that is uh, safe to do. So if you have a large list and you need to search it for um, and it, the operation of searching it is kind of expensive, it's like a really big list then you can create a variable that you're going to overwrite and then you can walk silently along your big list and when you meet your condition for searching the list you can assign the value to this variable that you just wrote and then in a new condition you can see if whatever you were looking for was found and do some action if it was so we found that you know, W, the 23rd letter of the alphabet was labeled with this function. So that's one of the one of the few use cases for super assignment. Okay, getting in setting. So inside of an environment, this method works of using the name inside of double brackets. You can also use this as we've already seen the um, dollar sign. However, uh, numerical, oops, numerical indexes do not work. It, um, as you can see there, does not work. Single brackets also do not work uh, because the single bracket replicates the type of object that you are indexing into. So if you use a single bracket on a list, it returns a list. And if you're an environment, it would have to copy the environment to return an environment with that subset. So um, single brackets do not work. And yeah, double brackets and the dollar sign return null if a binding isn't there. And binding null, like trying to overwrite a variable with null does not remove it from the environment. It just makes null that variable. So other notable functions for working with environments, the base assign function adds a binding using a string. And I tried to list the, the arguments to each of these functions in order as they appear, just for, for memory. So a string X, the value that's going to be assigned to it in the environment. Uh, M poke, which is from Arlang, uses an environment as its first argument, the name of the variable that you want to assign to that um, 
environment and then the value. You also have the option to create a new binding or error if no binding is found. So if you specifically are trying to overwrite, you can use this create. And if something doesn't exist, it won't overwrite it. Um, so it's kind of super assignment with, uh, with, with conditions. Uh, in bind takes an environment and binds multiple values with the dot, dot, dots. In has looks at an environment to see if it contains variables by name. Um, and the base equivalent of this is exists. I forgot to mention it here, but it's, it exists. Um, the difference between in has and exist is exist has inherits true. So it's automatically going to look all the way up through all the ancestors. Whereas in has does not, it's only going to look in the parent, um, the environment, or it's only going to look in the environment that you provide to it. And you can look up multiple, multiple variables with the names argument to that. And then unbind unbinds those environments. So that actually gets rid of them from that environment. It's the equivalent of base RM remove. Only it's more, it's slightly different syntax. Okay, so getting and setting. Uh, this is something I added. There are some McGritter tricks because I'm sure other folks have probably been in the middle of a pipe and been like, hey, I need this variable outside of this. Is the only way to assign it with, you know, like a arrow assignment or can I do something to it and assign something in the middle of a pipe? So basically there's McGritter in set which is virtually the same as a single subset and is usable in a pipe. Inset two is double brackets. There's this T operator that allows you to pass the results of one step in a pipe around the next step, such that the results end up going in as the input argument to the um, skipping a step. And then brackets allow you to create an expression along a pipe where you can place the result from the previous uh, step with the period operator. So here's a really untidy hack. Um, so if we take that long list that we had of A through Z as the names and 1 through 26 as the numbers, and we pipe it into inset 2, and we say A, which is the first item in that list, we want to change that to a character value, letter A. And then we want to skip this next one with that result. So we're going to pass that on down. But it also passes the result in here, although this, the output of this is not going to modify it and pass it on. So we pass the results directly to here and here. So we're going to assign um, new it's going to be the name of this new variable. And we're going to take the second argument of long list and the tenth argument, and we're going to multiply them, and we're going to assign that into the E environment. And then we're going to inset in the very last position of our long list a character vector that is AA. So if we look at the results of this, we can now see that if we do long list and we look at A, the first item in that list, it now says letter A. And we can look at the very last new uh, item on this list, and it's now this character. And if we look at E new, uh, it's now 20, since we multiplied 2 times 10. So that is a way to do that in the middle of a pipe. OK, so advanced bindings. Delayed bindings and active bindings. Delayed evaluate the first time they're accessed and active are recomputed each time they're accessed. If you've worked with Shiny, uh, you probably have some familiarity with active bindings. So delayed bindings example, this in bind lazy allows you to make a lazy binding. So if we run this the first time, we can see that syssleep ran and we have this uh, one second execution time. And then if we do it again, it's already executed. So it does not um, return again. 
or it doesn't run the sysleep, it just returns the value again. So this active binding, we can use M bind active. We're going to bind it to the current environment. We're going to make Z. And I'm just using the rlang anonymous function here with as function. And we can use the tilde notation to make a little anonymous function with the uh, random uniform generator with just a single value. And so when we run Z, it's going to run our unif once and twice. Every time it's called, it's going to recompute that value. So recursing over environments. So this, this one was kind of confusing to me when I first saw it because I've never really used a recursive function. But basically, we pass in a name that we want to find where and what environment it is and an environment, um, the calling environment. So if it's identical to the empty environment, then we're just going to stop because that's the end of the call, the call stack. And then if the environment has the name that we pass in, then that's success. So we're going to return that environment. Otherwise, we're just going to call this from the top. So that basically just goes back to the top and runs again. So kind of looping over itself like that. Um, a more explicit way that I found a little easier to understand, although I, um, uh, yeah, it's I, I felt it was a little easier to understand is using a while loop. So while the environment is not identical to the empty environment, so we're going to continue sequentially going up through the ancestors until we reach the empty. We're going to see if the environment has the name. And if so, we're going to return it. And if not, we're going to replace the environment that is looked in with its parent. Um, so it's going to go all the way up looking through like that, and it's going to return the environment that it lands on. Although this is going to return um, whatever the last environment is, even though it didn't find it. So that's something to be aware of with this function. Even if it didn't find the name, there's no actual break here. So whatever the last environment it looked in is, when it breaks this while loop is what it's going to return. So it actually works slightly differently than the last function. So here is a diagram of how that sequential environment search works. Every time you attach a package, it becomes a parent of the global environment. So if you went library rlang, it ended up here. And then if you went library HTML tools, it ends up here and then library and so forth. Um, and then when we search through the environments, we're going to search global and then in, you know, C, HTML tools, Rlang, base, up to NT. So package environments in the search path. The search path is a sequence of environments containing all the attached packages all the way up to the empty environment. There's multiple ways to go about examining what these are. Um, so here I've just mapped over these three types of functions that call the search path. So with base search, um, it creates a character vector that has these um, labels of package, if it's a package, and then auto loads or just the name of the environment if it's just an environment. Search paths actually tells you where each of these environments is loaded from. And then search environments actually gives you the environments so you can search them or manipulate them in any way you want. Um, and then this invoke function, if you have not seen it before, it allows you to invoke a function without any arguments. So it's just passing in these functions and invoking them um, and then taking the last five um, items from the results of that. So the last two packages on the search path are always auto loads and base. Auto loads is kind of handles like the on exit and on load functions, and it queues up packages to be loaded when you need them, like data sets and whatnot. Um, 
So you can access it with this dot auto load environment and you can access the base namespace environment like this, or you can use base base environment or Arlang base environment to access that. There's also base auto load to access the auto load environment. And it also has a couple of other options to interact with the auto load environment. So, oh, sorry. Okay. So a function binds the current environment when it's created, this becomes the parent environment of the function environment. So this might provide some insight into why that bonus uh, did what it did. Um, so I'm going to try something here. Um, all right, let's see if I can new share, share my other screen. That flip over? Yes, it did. Is it visible? Is the font big enough on it? It is pretty small. Okay, I'm gonna try to change that. Okay, let's try this. All right, that's a lot larger, but I lost my place. Okay, here we are. Is that is that better? Visible? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, uh, where is that function? Okay, here it is. So here's the the bonus function here. And we're just going to run this. And we've got a browser call inside of it that's going to open since we're running an interactive session. And we're going to take a look inside of this function to see what's going on and why it returns the weird stuff that it does. does. So the bonus is, why does it show the environment, the enclose, and expression for external? And just a hint here is we're going to look at eval. So here we go, run this. All right, make this full screen, hopefully. Yeah, okay. So is that visible down at the bottom there? Semi-visible maybe? That might be off the screen for y'all actually, because I have a different um, size monitor. Okay, is that visible? Yes. Okay, cool. So we're inside of that function. So we have CE. And we have the environment, caller environment that was called as an argument to the function. And we can see that those are the same. And we can see that CE is actually the global environment. So this one that we called from the as an argument to per walk actually picked up the global environment when we called it here. And we can see that like when we do that, when we look at it, we can see all the uh, variables in the global environment. And when we look at the one that's called internally or the one that's called from the function itself, we now see that there's this I. So where did this I come from? Because when we run this, there's no I directly in this execution environment. So the Answer is, if we're going to use utils recover that we mentioned last week, and we're going to uh, let's go back to the console. Control shift zero. Console, come back. OK, is that visible? So we can go up one level um, from inside of this function, just one level up. And we can see here that we're actually inside of the map function in the per name space. And if we go ls here, we can see there's a variable here i. 
So what happened is when we called the caller environment from inside of that anonymous function or within its arguments, its caller environment is actually inside of the per package inside of the map function where we're actually calling map implicit with the environment that was passed in and the variables that uh, came in from the lock function. And it just has this I here. So um, in this case, when we looked at the caller environment that was called from the we're going to go back and full screen this. Control shift one. And when we look at the, oops, it always moves. Okay, here we are. This is actually calling the global environment in this case. But if I go back and share the other screen again, we're seeing that it's actually has enclosure environment and expression here. So what that's doing is when we run this, when that document is knitting, um, this caller environment that's in the per walk function is seeing the environment in which uh, knitter is, has enclosed this chunk and the environment and the expression. So knitter goes to an RMD document and it grabs each chunk as a big expression and it grabs the environment of the whole document. And then it grabs the enclosure, which is kind of like the options that you pass to the chunk and it's like a function itself. And it executes eval, um, <clears throat> the eval function inside of knitter and evaluates everything that's in that chunk. So the caller environment that's being called from walk is that in eval environment that the R&D document is, uh, that Knitter is running on. So that's why it does that goofy stuff. So is this environment created by Knitter? Is that kind of in between what's going on to the chunk and what we might call like the global environment if it were a script? Yeah, exactly. So this environment here, this variable is what is getting passed to eval. And that is what would be the equivalent of the global environment that Knitter is just passing in as an argument to that. So the chunk still sees the global environment. Um, but uh, Yahui, I think you, you, I, his name is hard to pronounce, <laughs> uh, is passing in this environment to the eval expression, and that's the actual global environment of the RMD document that the chunk code is evaluating inside of. So yeah. So that hopefully doesn't confuse anyone and shows why that the function binds the current environment when it is created. So it was created, that anonymous function was created inside of the map function, and so it bound that environment as its current environment. And that's why that happened. And so that's something to be aware of. If you are, um, if you're trying to call an environment inside of an anonymous function, it might not call the environment you think it's going to call. So a name is typically bound to a function on function creation unless the function is an anonymous and it's passed as an argument. Um, and the environment in Oh yeah, okay, so the zoom thing is on top of it. The environment in which a name is bound to a function is not necessarily the environment that the function binds. Environment in which a name is bound to a function is not necessarily the environment that the function binds. Yeah. Okay, so we've already looked at that. Okay, so a function binds a global environment even if bound to another environment. So we can see here that if we make this function called G, we can print the execution environment. We can see that the caller environment is indeed the global environment. 
and is the caller environment and the parent of the environment inside of this execution environment the same? Yes. Does X exist inside of this function? No, it wasn't passed in inside of it. And we have inherits faults here, so it's just looking in the execution environment. But if we run X, it's calling X from the global environment because that's the parent. Uh, when it lazily evaluates here, how do we run it just before the exists? It would have evaluated um, spotlight. Okay. I don't, does that show up? Yeah, it does. Okay, cool. So it uh, it would have shown that the environment exists if we had evaluated just before we called exists, because it would have called it from the global and then it would have existed in the execution environment. Okay. Next. All right, accessing the environment of a function. So clear. All right, there it goes. The environment of a function is accessed through fn environment or just environment to access the environment of the function. You just plug in the function as the argument. The package environment is accessible on the search path. Only exported functions will be shown on the environment explorer with ls. The namespace environment is internal to a package. It binds all the exported functions. Um, it won't show the internal functions to the package, but you can access those with the triple colon. Names are bound to the package function in both the package and the namespace environment, but the function environment specifically sees the namespace environment. So this explains why I was found in the parent environment within that namespace environment where that function was created inside of per. All right, so here's a visual of why, how this all happens. User calls the SD function with the var that's being passed in there. And the parent of that is the imports of the stats, uh, which would be the dependencies of the stats function. Um, and then the namespace base, the global environment, um, which package stats is on top of that, and then up through whatever packages are bound, and then finally base again. So that is the order of the ancestors when calling a function with it from a package. Wait, I have so, a question that yeah. may be a silly question, but does that mean that if you have a ton of packages loaded, it could make running something slower because it's working its way through all of these environments? Um, the global environment, it goes to the imports base and then global mm -hmm. immediately. So it doesn't start going through those other ones until it gets past global. Okay. Okay. So if you have something bound in global, it's really going to go just through the imports, the base namespace, and then global. Um, so it's only going to search in those three environments. Um, whenever you load a package, I do believe it takes up RAM for the functions, not the data sets. It, put, it puts those in the auto loads environment. But every time you load a package with library, it will add those into the RAM of a function or of a of an environment. So uh, you can actually watch your like R, the space that your R instance is taking up and you can see how each time you load a package, it adds a little bit to the RAM. Um, yeah, but in terms of execution time, ideally you just explicitly tell where any variable that you're accessing in an execution environment is found. So you either tell it the environment directly that it is to be found, um, or you have it passed in as an argument. So, and that minimizes searching. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so all the imports that you would find in a namespace file are in that imports that it's right on top of the namespace of the package, the next parent environment up. And then there's the base and then global. So that's the general like search path that it, a function takes. So execution environments created fresh, not the same as the function environment as we saw. The function environment is more or less the environment in which it's created. The parent is the function environment. The environment is ephemeral and will disappear unless explicitly saved. Um, so um, the, this will return the same, same result all the time if called repeatedly. So if environment has current environment A, so if it doesn't have A, and define it, otherwise A plus one. So it just defines A each time because it doesn't find it every time the function is called. So if you wanna preserve the exit execution environment, you have to actually return it. So we can return it here with current environment. Um, so if we call H2, um, we, we can assign it to this environment and then we can print this environment and we can see that it saved the execution environment. It tells us the parent is global and it tells us there's these two variables inside of that execution environment. Um, if you're like trying to debug a function though, and you're thinking, well, I could just pass out the environment and see, um, it's probably easier to just put a browser call in here and open up inside of the environment in an interactive way, and then just use ls to see what's inside of it. Um, and that way you can modify in place. All right, so preserving the execution environment part two, return an object with the environment bound to it, such as a function. So if we declare a function in here, it's gonna automatically bring with it its function environment um, when you return it. So this is a, a function factory as Hadley calls it. So call stacks, the caller environment, uh, environment function was called from, we've seen that a couple of times now, and where it returns values to. So if we create this anonymous function that checks to see if the parent frame and the caller environment are identical, and we run it, we can see that that is true. So the call stack, as functions can call each other, uh, there can be multiple functions evaluating simultaneously. So the call stack can be simple or nested, which is, or branched. So here's an example of a simple call stack um, in F1. And I just added this variable because we're gonna take a look at something later on with this variable. Um, but we're gonna call function two. Inside of F2, we're gonna call function three. And then function three is just gonna throw an error. So when we call F1, it goes, we can see it better here. It calls F2, it calls F3, and then it calls the error, or in this case, it calls the lobster CST. So we can see the, the branches of the execution, or this is a linear execution, so they're not really branches, the steps of the execution. So here um, we can use the, at the last function, we're gonna take, um, and we're gonna try to get this flag variable that we created here in this top level function. We're gonna see if we can get this flag function or get the flag variable from the last function in the call stack. So we're gonna use get, which is the uh, um, base version of, um, in, in git and in Arling, and we're gonna inherit all of the environment. So it's gonna look up through all the parent, all the parents. And here's the Arling version. We're also gonna inherit. So we're gonna look up through the parents. So if we call this, we actually find that it can't be found. Even if it's going up through the parents, we can't actually find that flag variable, even though we passed it into that top level call. So, this becomes an issue if you're in a package and you're creating a lot of uh, internal functions and you are you want to grab a variable that got passed to the top level function. Um, you can't actually just grab it, it doesn't work. 
So here's a use case of how we can use the call stack. So we can search the call stack for a variable. So we're going to make this F3 function and we're going to look at the sys frame. So this is going to grab all the active frames. This is going to grab all the active calls. And then this is going to look at the first, uh, the first index of each of the calls. And then this is going to map along all of the calls. And we're going to look at that first variable in each call. And we're going to look for our function that was called F1, the top of the call stack. And then we're going to use this logical vector from this map logical. And we're going to subset the frames here. And we're going to get this flag variable. So when we call this, we can see the first element of the call. So if we look here, we're in F3. This is it's from starting from where we are all the way back up. It goes back up to F2, F1. And then now we can see that eval where knitter called eval and actually called it twice. And then we have all of these other like things that knitter is doing. Evaluate in deer. It's going all the way back up. So knitter is calling all these nested functions from the top level R markdown render until it gets down to F3. And we actually found F1 as false because we searched all the way up. We found F1 here because we looked for F1 with string detect in, the, uh, in these variables and we found it and we got the frame and we got the environment out of it and we searched in that environment for flag and we got it. So that's a way that you can search up the call stack and grab a variable from a function that was higher up in your call stack. I have a question. Uh, Is yeah. that because you never used flag, so it was never evaluated? Um, that's a good like, question. So if you're saying like, maybe if we put flag in function one and just like called it, maybe yeah. we could find it in that top level function. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, do you want to test and see? Yeah, I'll follow up. Okay. Yeah, if we have time, we'll go back and test that to see if that happens. Or maybe you can run it, see if you can uh, do that one. Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to. Uh, so lazy evaluation. Lazy evaluation can lead to multiple branches of the call stack. So we can see here, we're going to reassign F3 to Lobster CST. And we're going to also create one of those nested call stack situations uh, with C just calling X at the very bottom. So we can see here we have a branched one. So when we call A, it calls B, it calls C. And then when we call C, we're looking for uh, X. So X was F1 is what we passed as X. So it calls F1 which calls F2, which calls F3, which calls lobster. And so we can see that this branched off when X got evaluated. Each tier of the call stack is called a frame, i.e. each function in progress corresponds to a frame of the stack. Each frame is characterized by an expression, an environment, usually the execution environment, and the environment of the, or this is just saying that the environment of the global frame is the global environment. And using eval generates frames where the environment is a wild card. Um, so that's why uh, Yihui passes in the environment explicitly when he's calling it inside of Knitter. And apparent, which is the previous call in the call stack. So we could see here, this is like each previous call, each one of these is apparent to each one. It's also a frame. These are just the function names of the frame. Okay, so here's the eval expression. This is um, slightly outside of the scope of this, but it looks at how eval is called and uh, uses frames. So we're gonna create this function and we're gonna pass in um, whatever we give for X and we're gonna use call to, which constructs a 
uh, an expression and we're going to call mean the function we're going to give it mean and then we're going to pass in whatever we pass to fn to it we're going to print the expression and then we're going to evaluate it so we're going to create an expression here where we're going to call fn with five we're going to label that x so we're going to eval x so we eval x and we see that Arlang call to created this expression here, a function slightly with an anonymous and it uses use method mean and then it passes to that the value five that we pass to fn and then it evaluates it and we get five back from that. So we're actually just nesting and creating expressions inside based on the functions that we pass in. So that's how eval works and call to works. Dynamic scope, R does not have dynamic scoping, which means that like once a variable is defined, um, it cannot be redefined or like masked in a sub um, environment. Uh, this is kind of similar to, I think JavaScript const, see it when you declare like C-O-N-S-T with JavaScript, uh, that is dynamic scoping where you can't overwrite const. It's always gonna be whatever you bound it to. You can't mask it inside of another environment. Um, we're going to get more to dynamic scoping in chapter 20. So as a data structure, an environment as a data structure, it avoids copies of large data. You'll never accidentally create a copy. And we're going to learn more about this with R6 objects in chapter 14. Um, you might have used these if you had a variable where you used the dollar sign to call a function and it like calls it on itself. Um, R Selenium uses this. There's a couple of packages that use R6. Uh, it's kind of unfamiliar when you first start using it, but um, they are interesting. Managing state within a package. Explicit environments are useful in packages because they allow you to maintain the state across function calls. And a hash map is a data structure that is embedded in an environment. And it takes exactly like one computational cycle to access an object guaranteed. Um, so that's why it, it's like an index um, for accessing the specific named variable that you are calling. It will never take longer than one cycle. Okay, and then there's the quiz question. So, we are right with one minute left. So we'll stop there and maybe Torin has something for us. If you call flag, does it does it do a thing? Does it actually find it? Can you use git to find it? I can't remember the function. Okay, one sec. Let me switch over my screen. We can we can just do that real quick as long as nobody has to leave immediately. Um, blah, blah, the best R there. Share this. Okay. So we should, we're actually probably still in this function call here. So we need to exit out of that. Okay, let me get my orientation back with um, where we are in this. I need to find those F1, F2, F3. That was like, 7.5, yes, here it is. Okay, so create those. All right, and actually we need an F1, we need to actually call flag, right? Yeah, so let's, let's just call flag here. Oops, make sure it calls flag and evaluates it. And then let's rebind F3 to this one here. So this should be able to get it if that works. All right, so let's see what happens. Nope. Calling it did not work. So that's, that's good to know. So I guess the only way to get up the call stack to that initial call was either, it's either you explicitly declare flag as an environment to every subsequent one, which is kind of a pain, um, or 
you use this. I actually, um, because I had a package with like a lot of nested functions, I made this into a sub internal function where you could just pass a name in and it would uh, search up the call stack to the top level function in that package. Um, and it would it would search no further than that. And it would try to find that variable um, inside of the call stack of the package. So there might be a better way to do it, but that's how I went about it. Okay. So is this saying that the call stack is not like the parents? I don't know. I guess I'm confused. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't work? That's what I'm saying. I'm not sure. Like, I guess we could do like, if we did, let's, let's say F3. And instead of this, let, let's return, um, let's return just the parents. Okay, so there. Well, that answers the question right there. So even though it's all the way down in F3, the actual parent is still the global environment. So each execution environment is taking the caller environment as its parent. So that appears to be why that is happening. It doesn't actually go up the call stack, which is kind of non-intuitive to me, but I can see from like a user perspective, if you're not writing packages, which I think a lot of people aren't, it makes the most sense to have the global environment immediate to the execution environment, because that's where most people would have a variable that they're looking for. And Whereas package creators are thinking more in terms of like a call stack and nested functions, which is not like the most obvious and would, would be a slower search. It would search a lot slower if it had to go all the way up through the call stack each time to get to the global environment when it was looking for a omitted variable. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know the reasoning, but it seems like that's what it is. I have one more question. Yeah. If it's okay. Hey, um, I don't know. So in the book, Hadley says the base environment is special because it has to be able to bootstrap the loading of all other packages. And I didn't really quite know what he meant by that. I guess the base environment loads first and it it's what actually loads all the others. Cause it has like last week when we went through and listed all of the functions, it was like in the exercises, we listed all the functions in base, um, like all the different like methods and everything that R uses to load libraries and do all of the stuff that you would have to do to get an R environment set up is all contained in the base environment. So maybe that's what it means by that's a special environment is it's kind of like every other part of the R workspace is dependent upon base being loaded and loading all that other stuff up. Thanks, that makes sense. Yeah, and it actually behaves differently when you just load like an R script in like a R session and not in R studio. Um, I got, if you've ever put something that uses like stats or utils in your R profile, utils and stats aren't loaded yet. You have to actually call them by um, the like double colon operator to get anything to load from what normally would be loaded up when RStudio loads. So that's something to consider if you're writing scripts to be able to run in a background process. Any other questions, ideas, things that stood out, interesting things? You know a lot about this. 
a lot of trial and error and a lot of headaches. <laughs> Is this information mostly relevant as you're building packages? Um, I think I encountered a lot of these challenges while I was building packages or just like writing my own functions really mm -hmm. um, is where I encountered these, the environments thing where like the environment is different when you knit something versus when you are running it um, explicitly. Cause I've tried to do weird things with environments and had them fail miserably multiple times. And so I, I like went to advanced R and I read couple tidbits about like environments and mm -hmm. just troubleshooting random things kind of trial and error um figuring out how to solve issues but yeah especially the thing about like searching the call stack was a challenge while creating a package the caller environment thing with per though was something when i was just um creating a background script it would not like it would not i couldn't figure out why it couldn't find it would run in when i ran the document as an rmd and as soon as i put it over into a script it would fail and i couldn't figure out like it was really hard to debug because i was like why does this work when i run it in my r studio session and it never works when i run it in a script and that's when i figured out that like where you put that caller environment um like whether you put it inside of the anonymous function or in the function arguments or actually to walk itself it pulls a different environment um so if you're writing something to run in a background session that's something to be aware of depending on what argument you're trying to grab and pass into your execution environment Well, thank you for putting this presentation and examples together for all of us. Yeah, um, I made a branch and pushed it to the uh, advanced R book club repo. Do they just like eventually get around to that or something? Or do I have to like ping somebody on Slack? Uh, they, they added mine in like a day. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah, Tan manages that. So he'll probably get to it quickly. Okay, cool. Yeah, they probably just, they'll, they'll see it eventually. Um, cool. Well, thanks for sharing your time with me, everybody. I hope this was informative and uh, looking forward to learning more with y'all in the coming weeks. Let's see what's coming in the coming weeks. <laughs> uh, let's see. So we have the last chapter of section one next week with Estevail, probably pronouncing it correctly. So I'm apologizing in advance. And um, yeah, and then we get to start signing up for the further section. So um, Roberto signed up for a section three chapter. I just signed up for a section two chapter, but feel free to start filling in your names on that spreadsheet. Is that, um, where is that? Here, I just shared the link in the um, chat. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm kind of excited to learn about method and over Berto posted some methods question. I was like, I have no clue. I've never mm -hmm. learned about methods. <laughs> I'm definitely intimidated by the uh, sections we're getting into. I've heard that they were hard or like conceptually quite difficult. Huh. I believe it. <laughs> yeah, I think I will ask us to find uh, about the background in object oriented programming mm -hmm. for everyone. Because then we might want to have like a session for that as well, prior to dive in into actual object oriented programming with R. It would be good to have like a an overview. Do you yeah, want to do that? Yeah, I can. 
So we can have, I think that's chapter 12. So I will look into that and I will let you know. Okay. Yeah, like a preview. Hmm. Another video of all your object oriented. Do you think section two, the functional programming needs that too? Mm, I'm not sure. I will have to look. <laughs> we, can, we can figure it out when we get there. And uh... too late for now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the nine functionals, function factors, and function operators is a difficult one, difficult section. I don't know. I. It's been a while since I looked at the details, but I was told um, that section two and three were difficult. I think it was more section three where they split chapters up um, over a couple days or like a couple mm -hmm. sessions just because there was a lot of content to digest. Okay. Yeah, base types, S3, R6, S4, and trade-offs. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in R6 too. I've used them like once with uh, web sockets and they're, they're definitely confusing. I only have done S3, so that's why I signed up for chapter 13. Because <laughs> I think S3 it might be looks weird at the beginning, but once you get it, how it works, it's actually easy. Or that's what I think. I don't know. We'll see. S3 is like what R comes with, right? It's like the typical thing that we're used to using. Yeah. Yeah. So exciting. For six. Yeah, because R6, like, it's weird, like, has its own environment and then it modifies itself. I think I'm just going to worry about it when we get there. <laughs> yeah. I'm interested to do it, but I don't want to like set myself up to fail. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> well, that's why like... we have this book club, right? It's very low stakes. Yeah, it's low stakes. They can all learn together. So go <laughs> ahead, sign up. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, what is it? 13, 14? Which one is it? Let's see. 14, yeah. I guess I'll tentatively put myself for 14. I also greatly appreciate that everyone has readily like signed up for things or that it's never been the day before and I check and someone's like not signed up. So go team. Yeah. Yay, we did it. <laughs> but I mean, we've still got 20, like there's we got a while. chapters. So <laughs> I know. let's hope we can keep it up. Oh, also, I recognize next week is a holiday and some people might have the week off or it might be complicated if they have kids that are in school that are home. Do you guys want to skip next week and then do that chapter the following week or do you feel comfortable continuing through? Uh, it's not right on Thanksgiving, is it? It's just like the week of. Right, but I know that um, younger kids are in some places are out of school for the whole week. So I just yeah. want to check in with the group. I'm good to meet. Yeah, same. Okay. I don't okay. mind either way. I'm here. <laughs> All right, then we'll plan on it. Okay, sounds good. Good to see you guys. See ya. Yeah, Likewise, thanks. Next week. Next week. Thanks again, Stephen. That was really great. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank y'all.